A um, couple of quick announcements before we do um, get into the rest of what we're going to be talking about today. A um, couple of seminar announcements. Um, one in chemistry department, that's this Friday at 315, um, interfacing nanomaterials with biology, delivery to siRNA and CRISPR machinery um, for rapid cell phenotyping. Um, CRISPR, sort of, it's, this is the CRISPR week, I think, as far as seminars are concerned, because, oh, that's the wrong one, it's the bike I want. Um, <laughs> this um, seminar tomorrow uh, in the biology department, that's at noon, also in SB1, room 107, uh, Dr. Blake Wiedenheft, uh, CRISPR immune response to viruses that infect bacteria. I could tell you all kinds of stories about Blake, um, where he nearly killed me, and um, how he made me want to have a particular kind of skis, um, how he slept in a rocket box, you know, all kinds of fun stories. He's um, done some really amazing work with CRISPR and the structures of the CRISPR-Cas machinery. Um, did a postdoc with Jennifer Dudna, and has just really absolutely amazing stuff. So if you have any chance at all, reschedule whatever your lunch plans are for tomorrow um, and come over to SB1 107 from noon to 1 um, and hear Blake's talk and my introduction. I'm still trying to decide what slides or stories I want to tell about that. So <clears throat> without further ado, um, let's talk a little bit more about actually some of the viruses that I discovered when I was working with Blake, um, including the STIV um, virus up here at the top, which I've talked about multiple times already. Uh, this one right here. Um, yeah, I was working with Blake right when I actually found this one. Uh, before we move into the new material, just wanted to quickly review structures. Of, again, gross oversimplifications as always in biology and virology in particular. Um, smaller and simpler is better. So basically, as few capsid proteins as you can get away with um, in terms of coding in your genome and then being able to assemble into a relatively large structure, um, that either being helical symmetry where all of the subunits are interacting with each other in the same way, except for the ones at the very ends, um, or your icosahedral symmetry where you have either just purely pentamers that fit together, which is kind of too small, or you can add a bunch of hexamers, and we'll see a little bit more of that to, um, later today. Again, I cost a heater. I didn't bring my soccer ball, but people like I can bring that back again. Um, helices. And then last time we also talked a little bit about virus envelopes. Again, we'll talk much more about these when we talk about enveloped viruses um, a little later on in the course. But all of these virus envelopes, they're host lipids, but they're viral specific proteins that are sticking into these host lipids. And the budding process, which is where that genome either in an extra capsid or just by itself, will find these envelope proteins and then bud from the rest of the cell. And today we'll talk a little bit more about assembly and much more about disassembly because the whole idea of these structures is that they're stable as virions on the outside of the cell, but they're still going to be able to release their genomes once they get to the inside of the cell. So a um, couple things about taxonomy. Um, we'll talk about taxonomy, and then as far as we get with entry um, towards the end of the lecture today, big thing about taxonomy, um, it's not just the book. Ugh. Um, this is on the 8th edition, the 9th is heavier, and the 10th is probably going to be heavier still. Um, it's really all about the genomes. Um, if you want to think about how to classify viruses, we already talked about the Baltimore classification, and that's really how the big picture classification takes place. The problem is, is that's only, what, six or seven different ways of classifying viruses, and there are a ridiculously large number of viruses that are out there. So how do you think about classifying them in a <clears throat> more narrow way? Uh, one way to do that is hosts, and um, it may be a little hard to see in the back here, but um, on the spine here, we have various different color codings for the different groups of viruses and what hosts they're actually infecting. Um, for a great portion of the viruses here, it's talking about plant viruses. There actually aren't that many viruses that are infecting animals that we know of, relatively small number, quite a few more infecting plants, and 
way, way, way more infecting bacteria and probably archaea, although that's still kind of up in the air. One of the really new things about looking at, oh yeah. Okay, yeah, so the question is basically why more viruses of bacteria than of animals and plants, and is it because there are more bacteria? Almost definitely, yes, there are way more bacteria than there are animals and plants, and not surprisingly, there are viruses that are associated with all of these things. Uh, now, whether there are more viruses per organism for bacteria than there are for particular plants or animals, etc., that's an open question that we can argue about at some point. <laughs> so uh, it's not really clear. And certainly some of the ones have been more carefully studied, many more viruses have been found for. Uh, but the big change in taxonomy, literally in the last year, has been thinking about some of those little dots. Again, I keep coming back to the little dots that I talked about in the very first lecture. Uh, all of these environmental virions, really, <laughs> because we don't know what a lot of them are infecting, we presume it's the bacteria and the archaea, is looking at all of those from a sequence point of view and how do you classify all of these things just based on their sequences. Um, and that doesn't fit with the standard taxonomies here. So there's been a lot of discussion about that. There's way more diversity in all of these things that we just have sequences from virions from than any of these well-studied viruses. So if you want to talk about viruses in general, you really have to include them, but how best to include them. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But that's sort of the, the latest way of thinking about things. There are some alternative ways about thinking about virus relatedness. Those have to do with structures, which is why I brought my, my models today. And we'll talk a little bit about that um, towards the end. And it must be very important, I put in metagenomes twice here. So what's the standard taxonomy? The standard taxonomy is this. Um, the International Committee on the Taxonomy of Viruses. Believe it or not, there's an international treaty um, signed by most countries. I haven't figured out which ones haven't signed it yet. Um, which set up a committee to literally classify um, the taxonomy of viruses. So this is a international body um, which does this. Because the books are getting too ridiculous, uh, the current taxonomy is online. Um, if you're interested in thinking about all these different viruses, it's a great place to go. The way that the ICTV, until yeah, literally earlier this year, um, has decided to look at how to classify viruses, they start out with the nature of the genome. And this is actually a lot like what we talked about for the Baltimore classes. Single-stranded DNA in the virion, double-stranded DNA in the virion, positive-strand RNA, negative-strand RNA, um, double-stranded RNA, et cetera. Um, but that, again, is just a ridiculously large classification. And it's not even entirely clear if those are, in fact, related to each other. And sort of the idea of a taxonomy is to also think about a phylogeny. So where did these viruses come from? How are they actually evolving? So originally, the ICTV said capsid symmetry was a great way to go. So icosahedral versus helical. And we'll see some of the other examples that are not particularly that way. But most virions are icosahedral or helical. So that isn't terribly useful either. Um, presence or absence of an envelope. There are, yeah, that's a reasonable definition, although as we may see a little bit later on today, there are some viruses that actually have internal envelopes and then a protein capsule on the outside. How do you classify those, and, you know, presence or absence thereof? And then just the size of the capsid, uh, which again, makes sense, but these are some pretty you know, broad brush kinds of things. And actually, other than actual genome sequences, um, these shared properties actually say nothing about the phylogeny, the ancestry of any of these viruses. The only way to talk about real common ancestry, which I think is sort of the main point of taxonomy, is to look at genomes. And the big problem with looking at genomes is that viruses have probably been around for a very large proportion of the time that cellular life has been around, maybe even longer than some of that. And so the genomes get really kind of shuffled. And all of your sequences, there's no obvious comparison, at least at the nucleotide level, 
and often also at the protein level, amino acid level in terms of sequences. So maybe some of these things will tell you about these common ancestors. And then and there's this definition of a virus species. Now, okay, what's a you know, species concept in biology? Um, it's great now. They can reproduce with each other and perverse, produce fertile offspring. Well, how do you do that with something like viruses? Um, so the concept of a virus species is really kind of a, a challenging one. Now here, monophyletic. Now monophyletic means it's come from a single origin. Group of viruses whose properties can be distinguished from those of other species by multiple criteria. Talk about a wishy-washy kind of statement here. Um, so, but the multiple criteria are usually these kinds of guys up here. Nature of the genome, capsid symmetry, envelope, um, dimensions of the capsid. But if you start honing down into the, I think there are about 5,000 different species of, of virus described in here. Uh, how do you differentiate um, each of them from each other? So uh, that begins to be a little bit of a difficult question. As soon as you start to go to a higher level of taxonomy, so genus, family, uh, fortunately they don't try and go any beyond families in some of these viruses because that would get even messier. Um, those start to be very, very challenging in terms of thinking about how all of these viruses are related to each other. So this is what they called the virosphere, and this is also from the International Committee on Taxonomy of Viruses, and trying to give a bit of an idea what virus taxonomy should look like. So in the middle here, we have our double-stranded DNA viruses, single-stranded DNA viruses, positive-strand RNA viruses, negative-strand RNA viruses, and then reverse transcriptase viruses, these are actually um, separated from each other. Um, the problem that I have with this kind of image is that 99% of the bacterial viruses are in this one little tiny slice, and that actually represents this whole section basically here in the taxonomy. So I'm not terribly wild about this, but at least it gives you an idea of the probably completely expanding universe of all of these different kinds of viruses, again, from double-stranded DNA, negative strand, um, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah? Are the sizes of the um, fractions around the circle, are those representative of the number of species or number of monophyletic groups that we know of for those viruses? Yeah, so the, the, the question is basically, Again, I'll paraphrase your question here. But um, do the size of these wedges have anything to do with the diversity or relationship among these? Uh, the answer is they wanted it to, but it really doesn't. Um, because this whole section here, again, these bacteria with these um, head and tail bacteriophages, double-stranded DNA bacteriophages, these are way more diverse than any of the other viruses in the whole thing. So it would actually be completely crushed relative to everything else here. This was basically supposed to show a bit of the diversity which was, was present there. Um, and unfortunately, this is how probably 90 to 95% of virologists, however, think about viruses. Um, they don't think too much about some of, of these viruses or the, it's hard to see, unfortunately, here. These are the archaeal viruses here, um, which are, as far as diversity is concerned, at least as much as these negative strand, um, single stranded RNA viruses, which like Ebola and flu and all those boring viruses that nobody really cares about. Yeah? But a lot of our definitions of these viruses and what we know about them have helped to expand it greatly since 2005, right? So curiously enough, so the question is, you know, has an, has, this is ridiculously out of date, isn't it? It's like 12 years old now. Um, partly I think they haven't come up with a new one because it's become really, really messy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I've tried to find some newer versions of this. Uh, it's hard to describe other than sort of like the one big blob um, and how those blobs are related to each other is really an interesting and open question. So if you are, however, interested in taxonomy from the point of view of disease causing, so you care about a particular kind of virus and the way our textbook is set up, it's actually set up relative to different families. Um, that actually using this kind of relationship actually is pretty reasonable. Um, so if you're just concentrating on that disease causing aspect, this works quite well. If you're more interested in the phylogeny, which is I'm much more interested in, then this is not a terribly good way of looking at it. 
So I used to you know, pretend that I was going to burn this book after we were done here. But um, OK, so um, since the IT, ICTV is so wonderful, um, why don't we see what you remember about me telling you about it? According to the ICTV, which of the following is the most fundamental characterization for virus classification? Nature of the encapsulated genome, capsid symmetry, presence or absence of an envelope, size of the capsid, linear or circular genome. Oh, double A. And no, I haven't posted your clicker scores yet. Mea culpa. I keep meaning to do that in time. But <laughs> no, no double voting. <laughs> well, except then you'll give us more time, and I'll forget to. Oh, to get to get to vote again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no points for yesterday. Ten. Anyone else got your clickers? Good, ready to go. Fifty-two. Any more? One. Mamma mia. This is what I was looking for in. Molecular biology, all this term. What do we get? 100%. Woohoo! <laughs> um, yes, so it is, it's that thing that's on the middle part of the circle. So it really is the nature of the genome. So, yay, everybody gets points. Woohoo. Okay. Pardon? I've had 100% in the past, but. First 100 percent. The last term, I didn't get any 100 percent. So. I know. Well, you got some zero percent. I got some zero percent. That's true. Sort of the opposite. But that means I did a bad job. So, um, <clears throat> so just talking about now these different virus classifications again from the ICTV point of view. Um, <laughs> DNA viruses are uh, this. You know, again, the main portion here, almost the largest segment in this book. Uh, these are probably the most diverse viruses, and most of the bacterial viruses that we were talking about before are these DNA viruses. They go from the smallest genomes to the largest genomes. Some are less than 2,000 bases in terms of the length of their genome, and some are over 2.5 megabase pairs, so millions of base pairs. So, multiple orders of magnitude of difference in terms of the size of their genomes. Um, this should be a DSDNA, by the way, not an SSDNA. Sorry about that. So write the D on the board and see what happens. Put Sharpie up. That will work very well. Uh, so particularly these um, single-stranded DNA genomes are very small in general. You find them very commonly in environmental samples. And we'll talk a lot more about this later, those little green dots. Although, curiously enough, most of the nucleic acid binding stains to get those little green dots don't bind to these single-stranded DNAs very well. So if anything, the numbers of single-stranded DNA viruses in the environment are undercalculated. Um, but plants, animals, bacteria, all of these have single-stranded DNA viruses that are associated with them. And this is really bizarre uh, because none of the cellular machinery can deal with single-stranded DNA. So what's the evolutionary pressure to have single-stranded DNA viruses? Um, other than they're really small, and smaller is better. I don't like that argument terribly much, but it's certainly a, a possibility one. Now, of, of why this is. Uh, the other thing, of course, is, as I think someone mentioned before, the single-stranded um, you can also think of as just really single molecule because whenever you've got base pairs hanging out, if any of them are complementary at all to each other, you are going to form secondary structures. So whenever we say single-stranded, it means really one strand, one molecule, instead of two molecules that are wrapped around each other. Um, and these secondary structures, 
where you do have double-stranded parts of your single-stranded genome are really critical for the function of these particular viruses. The double-stranded, again, DSDNA here, um, bacteriophage, so the vast majority of the viruses that are infecting bacteria have these double-stranded DNA genomes, and they get to be ridiculously large. Two and a half megabase pairs is larger than quite a few bacterial genomes. Um, so the fact that you've got something that's really that large is probably because of all of the proofreading machinery that all of us learned about in molecular biology uh, and allows you to have these very, very large genomes. Double-stranded DNA for the vi genome of a virus makes perfect sense from the cell's point of view, or at least from the virus's point of view, because that's all of the cellular machinery. All the cellular machinery is fine-tuned to work with double-stranded DNA. So it makes a lot of sense that that would be um, what the virus is using for their genome. But there are also quite a few RNA viruses. I talked a little bit about these before. These RNA viruses can be double-stranded RNA viruses, single-stranded RNA viruses, either have the coding strand, which they're using for their genome, also known as the positive strand, or the negative strand, which is the complement of the coding strand that's being used for your messenger RNA. Turns out there are actually some which are part of each, so part of their genome is positive strand and part of them is negative strand. These are called ambisense um, RNA viruses because the virus doesn't know what's you know, positive and negative. So <clears throat> the positive strand RNA viruses, um, that's actually this segment of the tax this uh, taxonomy here, the pink one, in fact the broadest um, one which is here, very, very common in plant viruses. They have a whole variety of different capsid shapes. They can either be tiny little viruses that have icosahedral capsids, and in fact that T equals one icosahedron that we looked at last time. Um, the <clears throat> plant virus is one of those really, really tiny single-stranded DNA virus genomes. You also have very large enveloped single-stranded RNA viruses. Any ideas what some of those really big ones are? Nasty viruses that have caused some diseases. You know, heard about SARS? Anyone forgot about SARS? Um, that's a nice example of one of these positive strand RNA viruses. Uh, it's actually pretty amazing that these guys get up to about 31,000 base pairs in length. The predictions were that RNA viruses couldn't get that big because they don't have proofreading activity. It turns out that some of them actually do have a little bit of proofreading activity so, um, around them. Most of these have what's called unimolecular genomes. I haven't talked too much about unimolecular genomes yet, but these are, I like to think of these as kind of like individual chromosomes that you have in a virion. So you have, for the most part, these single-stranded positive strand RNA viruses have just one molecule. And that's true for the SARS, the coronaviruses, for these small plant viruses, et cetera. Uh, but for some, particularly the negative strand RNA viruses and the double stranded RNA viruses, often you've got multiple, again, I like to call, think of them as chromosomes. The virologists just call them segments. So they're segmented genomes. They're um, separate pieces. So they're actually separate molecules um, of each of the different pieces. So um, the negative strand RNA viruses, the classic ones here are things like the filoviruses, Ebola, but also influenza, which is a negative strand RNA virus which has a segmented genome, which is one of the big problems with influenza viruses because if you've got separate chromosomes, what can chromosomes do? They can recombine with each other, or you can actually have different chromosomes ending up in different virions. And we'll talk much more about that when we get there later. Yeah? Do all of the individual segments, they, do they code for different things, the segments of this genome, this viral chromosome? Okay, yeah, so the, the question is, uh, do those different segments, are they, is the analogy to chromosomes a good one? So you've got different genes on those different segments. And the answer is yes, you do have different genes on these different segments. So it's not like you usually have multiple copies, although there are some examples of that, um, of the same or almost identical genomes. Usually each of those different segments has a different sequence and then coding for different proteins on it. Yeah, I get the idea. 
so <laughs> where does segmentation okay, I'll, I'll back up again with your question a little bit. But um, evolutionarily, where does segmentation come from would be one way of putting it. Um, and we'll talk much more about flu when we do talk about flu and the, the recombination that takes place there. Uh, segmentation of genomes seems to have arisen multiple times in various different lineages. And quite why that is is a very open question. It may have to do, I've, I've talked to a couple of people about this, whenever there's a why question in biology, the answer is always don't ask why questions or evolution. <laughs> <laughs> so presumably there's a selection um, for that. Now what those selections are is not entirely clear. Yeah, Angela. Um, didn't form secondary structures that only the DNA <laughs> to each other? So the different segments form secondary structures with each other, you mean? Yeah, if they're single-stranded, like you said, in the, with the single-stranded DNA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so any time you have complementary sequence, complementary base pairing, you can form secondary structures. And it turns out for, I think actually, all of the single-stranded RNA viruses, at least the ones I can think of, um, those secondary structures are absolutely critical for replication or formation of messenger RNA or, or some aspect thereof. So we'll talk a lot more about those different secondary structures um, later on. Yeah? Sorry, last one. Um, so for these individual segments, do they all have to be integrated into the genome in order for the virus to reproduce? Can you just get one? Are there certain ones that are essential and other ones that can or can't be integrated? Okay, so this is, maybe I mis-explained this. So here, um, in the cases of these segments, particularly these negative strand RNA viruses, the ones that are really well known, like flu, uh, these are RNA segments that generally always exceptions, again, this is biology, um, have nothing to do with the, the host genome at all. They're just replicating by themselves. It's RNA goes to RNA goes to virion. So okay. they have nothing to do with the cellular genome at all. So there's no integration that takes place there um, in those cases. So it's just separate RNA. So they're just you know, doing their own thing as far as that's concerned. Um, and I'll get to the retroviruses in just a second here because <laughs> that's the exception to that rule or the big exception anyway. Uh, there are a few double-stranded RNA viruses. Almost all of these have segmented genomes as well. Um, we're not going to talk any more about these double-stranded RNA viruses. They're incredibly cool and fascinating, but we just don't have time um, to talk about some of these things. The, the nastiest of these are the rotaviruses, um, which cause diarrhea, particularly in the developing world. And they're, they've also got some really fascinating structures that if you're interested in, we can talk about offline. Um, getting back to... Ian's question about integration, um, you've got, <clears throat> as well as the DNA viruses, the RNA viruses, you also have this whole new segment, which you know, David Baltimore was one of the people who discovered, um, which are these viruses whose genomes sort of vacillate between DNA and RNA, and they actually require both an RNA and a DNA intermediate in their replication cycle. And it turns out that these so-called retroviruses, because they're going backwards, because it should always be DNA goes to RNA to protein in the standard dogma. These are now RNA going to DNA. These all have specific enzymes that do that, the reverse transcriptase. So it takes RNA and makes DNA out of it. But it turns out that the way these reverse transcriptase encoding viruses will package their genomes, sometimes they package DNA. Sometimes they package RNA, and sometimes there's actually a little bit of a combination of DNA and RNA that gets packaged. Um, so the packaging step seems to be able to take place at multiple different parts of this replication cycle. There are some of these DNA parts of the replication cycle that can integrate with the genome. This is the classic retrovirus, HIV um, integration into the host genome. And that's an absolutely critical part of the life cycle, if you'll forgive me for using life with viruses, um, of the way that these guys are going to replicate. So um, retroviruses package RNA. HEPA DNA viruses um, package a partially double-stranded DNA that has an RNA that's hooked up to one end, the 
classic example of this is the hepatitis B virus, um, which has a retroviral replication step. And then the cholemoviruses. Any, any idea what a cholemovirus infects? We'll talk much more about plant viruses later. Cauliflower. So the plant virologists very often will name their viruses based on whatever species they infect. So here, the cauli for cauliflower, mo is the mosaic phenotype that it gets with the disease virus. And so people thought these you know, retroviruses is only you know, higher eukaryotes that had them. No, they're, they're all over the place. Um, and in the case of the cholemoviruses, they replicate via this reverse transcriptase mechanism, but their packaging almost completely double-stranded um, DNA. Now, there are a few virus-like replicons, um, which I'm not going to talk about any more than just now, but the textbook mentions them. And uh, whenever we talk about you know, what's a virus, what's not a virus, uh, these things start to be um, all the exceptions which are proving the rules. So there are a few what are called satellite viruses. Um, someone, I think it was after class, asked about viruses that infect viruses. So you know, all organisms have viruses that are associated with them. Do viruses then get infected by viruses? Uh, these satellite viruses are a little bit like that. So this is a virus whose replication depends on not just a host, but a host that's infected by another virus. And um, the, the best known examples of these are some of the bacterial viruses. But it does seem to be a pretty common occurrence that you have basically a piggybacking virus on another virus infection. There are also some viroids. And you know, why people call them viroids? Basically, this is the completely naked RNA virus. These are infectious RNAs. Um, now, how do you get an infectious RNA? And how does that RNA get from one organism to the next organism? And how does it cause disease? These RNAs, in some cases, are hundreds of nucleotides long, or actually, in some cases, even less than 100 nucleotides. How the heck that causes some kind of disease is a really open question, and nobody has a very good handle on it, which is partly why we're not going to talk too much about them for the rest of the class. <laughs> um, we will briefly cover them when we talk about um, some of the plant viruses uh, a little bit later on. And some people say these are the remnants of the RNA world, which happened before we, we I also like to think the virus invented DNA. It's another different story. Uh, but before DNA was being used as the genetic material, RNA was being used as the genetic material. And some of these viroids may be leftovers um, from that time. Yeah? Is there any appearance of satellite viruses and uh, their helper virus, any horizontal gene transfer or genetic exchange happening there? Or are they pretty much independent in that way, the one just uses Okay, so the, the question has to do with sort of satellite viruses and their, you know, the virus that they're, as it were, parasitizing, to use this. Is there any kind of recombination that happens between those two genomes? From what I remember of these, and it's not my expertise, but the, you actually have very different genomes. So the satellite virus and the other virus which this has been infected, they have very, very different genomes relative to each other. Now, at some point in the past, they may have had some kind of recombination that took place, but now they seem to be two very different lineages relative to each other. Yeah? So is it the fact that it needs the machinery that the other virus can make that it can't make itself, and that's why it won't survive? Yeah, so basically the idea here is that there's some extra thing that that satellite virus needs that it's not encoding itself in its genome. And the best examples of those, or the best studied examples, I should say, actually have capsid proteins. So they don't encode a capsid protein at all. And so you don't encode a capsid protein, but still form virions. That then is a, something you clearly have to have that. But presumably, again, historically, from the phylogeny, that virus actually did encode a capsid protein at some point. But it found that when it infected another cell that had that capsid protein, it could do away with that part of its genome. And still replicate from that point of view. Yeah? I think you already said this, but uh, did you say, um, did, do they like piggyback on the viruses to get inside the cell? Are they sort of passing the virus inside? Yeah, so the, the question actually has to do, your, so correct me if I'm wrong here, having to do with the actual entry process. 
and how the virus actually get inside the, inside the cell, how their genomes get in, yeah. is one dependent on the other, basically, does it come along for the ride? Yeah, so the, these, these cases of the satellite viruses, pretty much it's a, they have their own separate genomes that come in separately into a particular host, but the genome of one of the viruses can only end up making a new virion if there's other virus encoded sequences in that particular cell. So it's requiring some genetic component from another virus, which happens to be in the cell. Yeah, so the question is, you know, how specific are these interactions, really, between the satellite viruses and the helper viruses? Um, usually they're very specific. Um, and we'll talk about some of the adeno-associated viruses a little bit later on, some of the smallest viruses around. This can only replicate if there's an infection with an adenovirus. Some of the bacterial viruses can only replicate if there's another virus which is there. But it's usually a very specific kind of interaction. Yeah. So hepatitis D is a really nice example of one of these um, satellite viruses, although there's some, it breaks down, of course, <laughs> when we talk about some of the very little details about that. But yes, hepatitis B is a nice example of one of these satellite viruses that does, um, in fact, seem to cause disease, but you also have the other disease-causing virus which is in there, so what the separation there is is, is a little unclear. Okay, so we're all happy with this. What does that mean? Time to get out your clickers. Ian's got it down. The whole system ready to go here. <clears throat> I see the look on your face. <laughs> he's, he's, he's ready to do this. So um, which kinds, Baltimore classes of viruses, let's start this, um, have the largest genomes? Single-stranded DNA viruses, double-stranded DNA viruses, single-stranded DNA viruses plus strand, single-stranded RNA viruses negative strand, reverse transcriptase viruses. Hopefully you can do another 100%. That would be great. Must be really twisted to be trying to read my mind, but <laughs> I certainly wouldn't want to. <laughs> Well, the, num the numbering is different between the two. Yeah, and as I mentioned last time, the numbering, I can never remember it. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. People will talk about those individual classes, but I will try not to specifically for this course. As I'll do this kind of thing. <laughs> Jean-Michel Cleverie is the answer to that. <laughs> Five. So, up. Oh, let's show the results. Yay! Two. This is ridiculous. I'm gonna have to start asking harder questions or something. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't do that. No, no one would like that at all. Okay. Yeah, that's. I'm teaching very well. Thank you. Yes, that's what it's all about. Or I came up with these questions um, far too late at night. This case may be. So uh, this process, um, again, of thinking about different virus genomes, you know, double-stranded DNA viruses, how are they related to each other, et cetera. And if you have these sequences which are not obviously related to each other, how can you think about how viruses are really well related to each other? And this brings up a um, virus that I discovered, so I'm quite proud of it, um, the Sulfolobus turdidicosahedral virus. And we talked about this already when we talked about the triangulation numbers, T equals 31, hopping from five-fold axis to five-fold axis. Um, this, I thought, was really cool, um, except for the fact that the postdoc who was working on this in Jack Johnson's lab, we were collaborating with on the, uh, this at the time, said, oh, you know, that, these projections are fine and, and wonderful, but actually, the major capsid protein is way more interesting. See so, you know, this blue stuff down here at the bottom. 
And why is that? Well, what they noticed <clears throat> was that this virus that I discovered, um, this was in a hot spring in Yellowstone National Park, was infecting archaea. And they looked at the capsid protein structure of this particular virus, and it, um, hang on, let's uh, go back here, do our, um, it looked, eh, get my pointer to actually work here, it looked like this. Wow, okay, cool, who cares? Um, it wasn't that exciting to me. But when they then pointed out that this structure was actually extremely similar to the major capsid protein structure of a bacterial virus, PRD1, and also this structure was extremely similar to the structure of adenovirus, which is infecting humans. And actually, these are some of the printouts that I have up here at the front. You know, hard to tell, of course, um, here, but come on, take a look later. These are actually some of those capsid proteins, now from viruses that are infecting three organisms from completely different domains of life, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. The structures, from that distance, you can probably see, they're absolutely identical to each other. But it turns out that the sequences of the amino acids here are completely different. You can't see any sequence similarity whatsoever. So structural conservation in viruses infecting all three different domains of life, but no sequence similarity. Why could this be? Um, horizontal gene transfer is definitely a possibility, but you'd have to have horizontal gene transfer going from bacteria to archaea to eukarya, and you know, viruses infecting all these three different domains of life and exchanging genes with each other seems highly unlikely. Um, certainly could be an example of convergent evolution. This is the only way to make really fascinating look, looking icosahedral virus particles. Probably not the case, and we looked last time at poliovirus, which actually has a very different kind of structure that makes up an icosahedral particle. Um, we like to think this means that these viruses all had a common ancestor virus, which is then diverged in terms of sequences. And what that means is there was a virus infecting the common ancestor of bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Well, that was probably a couple of billion years ago, which means that these viruses are potentially really, really, really old. Now, this is all indirect evidence. Um, we published this, wow, 13 years ago. Um, kind of frightening. Um, also, um, when I was in <coughs> Wolfram Zillig's lab, um, there's another paper that published actually this particular crystal structure. But the take-home message here, um, for me anyway, is that there are these viruses that infect completely different domains of life, bacterial viruses, archaeal viruses, and eukaryotic viruses, that have really superimposable structures relative to each other. And that, of course, means that the Ur virus, the original virus, looked just like the one that you know, I discovered um, back here. Probably had this kind of capsid protein fold that was associated with it. And I'm not the only crazy person who thinks this. Uh, there's <clears throat> a whole group of people um, under Dennis Bamford at the University of Helsinki in Finland, who's also done a lot of work looking at these different viruses. Here we've got the PRD1 and STIV. Here are the overall structures here. Um, I have a 3D printed version of actually the single structural protein. These guys come together as trimers. All three of them come together. And that then makes the hexameric subunit that fits in between the five-fold axes of symmetry. Um, and what they saw was that this is true for lots of different viruses. All of them have this so-called double jelly roll, two basically beta barrels right next to each other in an individual protein structure. So they use this, and then other people are using this, to make kind of an alternative taxonomy for looking at viruses and saying these are a particular structural class of viruses. And that, not just taxonomically, also hopefully tells us something about the phylogeny. And it turns out there are a relatively small number of these protein folds that seem to come together to be able to make virions. So it's an alternative taxonomy
for thinking about how the relationship of different viruses is just looking at these structures. Yeah, John. So will STIV and adenovirus survive boiling in acid? STIV will definitely survive boiling in acid. Um, adenovirus will not. Um, their structures are very similar, but their stabilities are very different relative to each other. And it's probably the individual amino acid side chains. This one, you know, okay, I could get you to all come up here and tell me which one is from which kind of organism. You know, one of these is archaeal, one of them is bacterial, one of them is eukaryotic. Um, but it has to do with the different side chains and that stability in the STIV, which makes it much more stable, as far as we know. We actually haven't figured all those things out yet. So would this way of grouping them just be purely off of like the morphological species kind of concept and disregarding the, the biological or the phylogenetic one because you have completely different sequences between these? Yeah, so the, the question here is basically, isn't this like going way back in terms of thinking about you know, how organisms are related to each other? You're looking at morphological differences. Um, this is morphology at the very, very fine scale. Um, and the assumption here is that these morphologies are some kind of shared trait. So the morphology actually does represent a phylogeny, so the history of these things. And yes, it's an assumption. You could have convergence. You may just end up with these particular kinds of structures. So you, we could be totally fooling ourselves um, in this process. But at least there's a structure that you can put on some of these things and think about how some of these things may have evolved. Okay, so that's a, one new way of thinking about um, virus phylogeny and virus taxonomy is at a structural level. And, and you're exactly right. It is kind of going way back to the morphology way that people describe different species. Um, there's another problem, and this actually has to do with sequences. This is the metagenomes that I put up twice in my overview slide, which means it must be really important, right? Um, or I wasn't proofreading it properly. So uh, the metagenomes, everybody know what a metagenome is? Want me to describe it again, please? Um, so the whole idea of a metagenome is it's an environmental sample that you just sequence as much of the nucleic acid as in there as possible. So it's not a single organism that you get and sequence the genome sequence from that single organism. It's all the organisms together, and you get usually partial sequences of the all of the mixture of organisms which happen to be there. Now, this has been done a lot for viruses, the virus metagenome. How do you do a virus metagenome? You collect all of the particles that are not cells and sequence them. And then you look at all of those sequences, and you try and compare those sequences to known sequences that you find in you know, big, thick books like this or online. And what people found um, particularly for the single-stranded DNA viruses, but this is true for lots of other viruses as well, is you have lots and lots of sequences that are similar to each other, and you can do nice phylogenies like this. And um, this phylogeny is basically, and we talk about trees, we know how to make trees. Basically, the distance between each of these individuals has to do with the relative number of sequence differences between each of them. Um, and the more branches you have, the more diversity you have. These are now all environmental sequences except for these colored pieces here in the rest of it. So basically, there are a lot of related sequences in these single-stranded DNA viruses, but most of them are not obviously related to any other virus that anybody's seen before, except at a very, very deep level down here. So there's a huge amount of viral sequence diversity. What do you do about this in terms of a virus taxonomy? And so this is the paper I was talking about. Um, it was just published a little bit earlier this year, um, 2017. The ICTV has, in my completely biased opinion, finally come around and decided that we can think about naming species of viruses in the absence of having a capsid structure or a specific host that we know these guys are infecting. Because the vast majority of these things, only one, anyone's only going to know about them just in terms of their sequence. And getting back to your question about you know, bacterial viruses versus the number of bacteria, 99.9% .9 of bacteria nobody cares about. And no one's really going to study them. 
And so they're not going to study the viruses that are infecting them either. But they'll find them when they do these environmental studies where they do all of these sequences. So if you want to think about these kinds of viruses, just taking those sequences and not ignoring them, putting them into some kind of taxonomy is useful. And so these, as it turns out, are what are called the Cress DNA viruses. Um, we don't need to get into too much detail on this, but they're single-stranded DNA viruses. Um, all clearly related to each other, but a massive amount of diversity, which is probably just going to be present in the environment, and likely no one's going to study the vast majority of these things. But at least now this internationally recognized body is saying, OK, we are going to think about giving these things specific names so people can talk about them, as opposed to sequence NC537-485. So um, that's the, the basic idea there. So any more questions about taxonomy before we talk about virus entry or start to talk about virus entry? Um, maybe I missed it on the last slide. Uh, what were the colored little triangles? So the colored little triangles on here are where there actually are known viruses. And you'll notice there aren't very many of these triangles <laughs> compared to all of the uh, little ends here, the twigs in your tree, um, each of which is representing a sequence in a metagenome. And it turns out, actually, most of those uh, triangles actually contain lots of sequences as well. Some of them actually just contain one virus and a whole bunch of related sequences that are associated with them, too. Now, but if you're interested, uh, like the link to the paper there, so you can check it out. I think that one's open access. OK, any more questions about taxonomy? OK, let's talk about virus entry. No, I'm not going to ask you a quicker question yet. Uh, so a couple of um, big picture things as far as um, virus entry is concerned. And we'll continue to talk about uh, virus entry <clears throat> on Friday. Uh, virus receptors. This is a really important concept. So the receptor for a virus is the cellular molecule that the virus interacts with on the outside of the cell. It could be a protein, could be a lipid, could be a sugar, all kinds of different things. So when people talk about virus receptors, that's what the virion interacts with on the outside of a cell. For a lot of the, yeah? But those are produced by the cell. They're all cellular. All virus receptors are cellular. This is a cellular thing. Um, and all viruses need to get into cells in order to replicate, so you know, that's the, the first step. Uh, many viruses will get inside of cells, and when I say the virus getting inside the cell, it's really the virus genome getting inside the cell, through membrane fusion events. Um, and we'll look at how it's known about membrane fusions um, here in a lot more um, details. Uncoding, um, this is if you have your metastable virion, some of that genome needs to be released so the cellular machinery can do something with it. Uh, and then once that virus genome, or sometimes actually even the virus capsid, gets inside the cell, very often it's not in the right place. Um, many of the eukaryotic viruses replicate only in the nucleus. The membrane's quite a long way away from the nucleus, so how does the genome get from the site of entry into the cell to the nucleus in order to be able to get to replication? And then um, a lot of antiviral drugs actually work on this entry and, and transport step. Um, basically, everything you need to know about virus entry is in this one figure from our textbook. It's ridiculously detailed and lots of different uh, viruses which are on here. Uh, but it gives you a bit of an idea of the various different ways that viruses get inside of cells, or virions, I should say, release their genome. Um, sometimes you have fusion here. Pieces of your genome end up in the nucleus. Sometimes you'll have endosomes. Very often, this is the classic case of a receptor-mediated endocytosis. Hopefully that means something to those of you who've been in cell biology, take cell biology. So interaction with something on the outside leads to formation of a vesicle, brings that virion inside the cell. That could be either with an enveloped virus, um, actually like this one down here, could be a non-enveloped virus, which gets there. Here's another enveloped virus, which gets picked up in endosomes. These are probably the most common ways that 
viruses get taken up inside the cell. Part of the reason for that is the virus depends on the cell to be alive and functional, at least in order to start making more of the virus genome, the virus proteins, etc. So if viruses were making big holes in membranes when they came in, the cell wouldn't be real happy. So it's in the virus' best interest, again, totally over-anthropomorphizing here, to have the cell be relatively happy. So they're using mechanisms which are often exactly the same mechanisms that cells would use in terms of picking up nutrition, et cetera. Yeah? Okay, we'll talk about some of the endosome sorting and the endosome changes. So some virions will change the endosome. Some virions take advantage of the changes that happen in the endosome. Lots of different things that will happen there. Yeah? Um, so I see there's seven different viruses mm -hmm. up here, seven different types. Are these, are these representative or loosely representative of their respective type? Like is HIV going to represent how most retroviruses get in? Is, you know? So these... <clears throat> These are so the, the sort of the seven different types here. Uh, most of the viruses that are similar to that will get in in similar ways, although it turns out that the more we study these things, the more differences you see even between very closely related viruses. Um, people always talk about, so a receptor, you've got a particular receptor that a virion associates with. Well, it turns out the very closely related viruses actually have different receptors. Um, SARS and MERS, for instance, are very closely related viruses that use very different receptors relative to each other. The actual entry process is, however, pretty similar for most of those. Uh, but it does vary a little bit. Uh, but yeah, this is, a, I think it's a great place to go back and take a look at in terms of, of a lot of these different structures. One of the things I wanted to quickly show here, if I can get this to actually work, is a... Eh, Nice video, if I can get the link to actually work here, um, into, um, this is a bit of an oversimplification, if I can get it to actually work, maybe it will, maybe it won't, here we go, uh, of viruses entering into cells through this receptor-mediated endocytosis process. And now, of course, it's refusing to load um, this particular thing. Well, I'll probably show this um, the beginning of class next time. Let's take a look at some of these other ones that we have here. Um, so <clears throat> probably the best understood of these virus entry processes is what happens in influenza. Everyone, actually, has anybody listening to the news recently heard about H9 or H10 influenzas that are killing a number of people in Southeast Asia? Um, rather high pathogenic viruses. Um, the H for any of these H5N1, H10N4, etc., that H stands for the hemagglutinin. And the hemagglutinin is this protein, it's a membrane glycoprotein in these enveloped viruses on the outside of all these influenza viruses. This binds to heme, causing the hemagglutination, which is why it's got the name, but it's also the critical protein in terms of getting that enveloped virus into a particular host cell. The way that that works is it's a, made as a fusion protein. We talked about this before, how do you get a metastable state? Very often we have proteolysis. So here proteolysis takes place, cuts this protein into two pieces, and then under low pH environments, where do you see low pHs? In the endosome, when it comes inside the cell, the pH changes. And with a pH change, this protein has a huge conformational change. And what it does is it takes this small peptide right here that's otherwise covered and blocked by the rest of the protein. This is incredibly hydrophobic. And as soon as you have this change in pH, there's a big rearrangement of this structure, and this so-called fusion peptide, which is now, again, highly hydrophobic, will stick itself into the host membrane and lead to fusion taking place. 
So now I'll try and look at some of these other. There we go. Pff, missing the plugin. Thanks. Okay. Uh, we'll follow up on, on these guys um, in the next lecture. But <clears throat> these uh, fusion. Um, these are all animations, um, work done from various different labs. Most of them, um, I think the dengue one was done at Yale, the um, HIV one um, was done at Harvard. Um, all of these have to do with changing of structures of these virus envelope glycoproteins in order to get um, the fusion to actually take place here. So we'll see if we actually finally got this one to load. And if not, OK, so view the animation below. Click to use Flash. Will it actually work? Trust it. <laughs> yes. I said I wanted to do this. OK, so um, we'll just look here at this particular um, animation. Here we have a classic enveloped virus with the capsid on the inside. Um, this runs about three or four minutes. Here we have interaction of the capsid here block that. Um, interaction of our protein spikes here with a receptor on the inside of the cell. Here we have a direct membrane fusion that happens at the external membrane of the cell. Here we have the capsid. The capsid is degraded by magic mechanisms. The genome um, is then used. You can also have now, instead of fusion of the two membranes that takes place right here, now you have endocytosis, where we have this endosomal vesicle, which is then brought inside the cell, and then the capsid is released from that, or in some cases, the direct genome. Yeah? So the question is, are these usually clathrin-mediated? Usually not clathrin-mediated. There are a couple of viruses that use these clathrin-mediated ones. You can also have a naked virus, so a non-enveloped one, that gets taken up by this uh, receptor-mediated endocytosis, and that then is released. The genome is released um, from that case. So these are the very general cases. We'll look at those specific cases on Friday. Those of you who got here a little late, I um, highly recommend the biology seminar tomorrow at noon. Lake Wiedenheft um, from Montana State University talking about CRISPRs.